Well, my apologies for not being with you today on this fine day in uh, Palm Springs. I'm uh, emulating uh, Greta Thunberg uh, in saving my carbon as well as being the savior of the planet by looking at EGS as a potential future low carbon energy source uh, for the planet. Uh, so we should view ourselves as the true uh, saviors of the planet uh, as we sit here in this, this meeting. Anyway, um, today I'd like to talk about complex processes and these couplings uh, that control the viability, if you like, of deep geothermal energy systems, typically EGS, but also talk about it in the framework of um, the spectrum, if you like, of geothermal systems from hydrothermal through sedimentary geothermal reservoirs to ultimately these cookie cutter uh, engineered systems that we'd like to be able to, uh, to make and talk about what some of the challenges might be, at least in the area that, of my interest and in the area in which I know about some of these things. In the broad sense, um, this spectrum of behaviors from hydrothermal through EGS, um, the Set Heat Initiative, which John Holbrook runs and ran as a, uh, an NSF uh, RCN, looked at the viability of developing sedimentary geothermal reservoirs. And of course, uh, both hydrothermal and sedimentary geothermal reservoirs are much easier to do. Hydrothermal because in pull-apart regions, permeability and porosity are often there, and temperatures are high because uh, uh, magma is high within the Earth's crust there. Sedimentary regions, the rewards aren't so great, but the flow rates are at least are high. And of course, the, the most difficult one of these is the most scientifically challenging, and that is uh, EGS, but which is the holy grail, because if you can crack that, it's a high-risk, high-reward system that has just huge potential and huge potential to be uh, deployed anywhere on the planet, which is, of course, the, the, the dream of, of EGS. Uh, but to date, as we know, it hasn't been a complete success, and certainly it's not an economically viable system. Uh, this magic uh, 5 megawatts uh, electricity equivalent from a well uh, representing something like 100 kilograms uh, per second per well has been elusive. Um, and is a difficult uh, uh, nut to crack. It's been fraught with problems of seismicity, uh, this being one that uh, halted the planned uh, work in the geysers at the time of the global financial crisis in 2009, uh, and also the other events in Basel and elsewhere. Uh, and so the challenges in all of this are in being able to uh, overcome these issues, pr finding the resource, accessing it very inexpensively to reduce the per well costs and therefore maybe change the, the 5 megawatt uh, output requirement threshold, uh, being able to create the reservoir in the first place, which has been challenging in itself, making sure that it stays productive over time, and being able to mitigate the environmental issues, not least of which is induced seismicity. And so the observation is that this is so difficult uh, because basement rocks, deep, hot geothermal rocks are very stress sensitive. The transmission characters are highly stress sensitive. And these stresses are controlled by both effective stresses, pumping fluids in, thermal stresses in the quenching of the reservoir, and also chemical stresses that are added in changes to the reservoir that occur transiently with the, the circulation of fluids. So understanding the interaction of these behaviors, these uh, hydraulic and thermal and chemical behaviors as the impact the mechanical response of the reservoir clearly is a, a key issue to understand. The difficulty really is summed up in this uh, simple equation that relates the, the heat rate or the power to the mass flow rate, the temperature recovery, and the specific heat capacity of the fluids that are used. And it highlights the difficulty of, of doing this. We know that Certainly, we can probably get large fluid volumes out of these systems, but if we don't provide enough heat transfer area to be able to allow those fluids the long enough resonance time and the heat surface area to be able to pull out the, the temperature of the reservoir, then we pump in cold fluids and we get out cold fluids. And so moving fluids from uh, micro Darcy levels, which they typically are uh, at between 4 and 5 and 6 kilometers, up to... Um, milli-Darcy levels is a challenging uh, activity in itself. 
Uh, and so this is really the, the issue that uh, we have to be able to, to crack, and so far has not been done. It's a much more difficult problem, however, rather than, as you know, than just uh, being able to get circulation of fluids in the system. And it's more difficult because we have to make sure that these fluids are circulated evenly through the system. In other words, broad circular, broad sweep. We know that the efficiency of the system is, uh, in terms of getting uh, heat rates out of the solid, is a function of a large volume of the reservoir and a small volumetric flow rate and a small spacing between the fractures. So this, where all other things are equal, thermal conductivities and the uh, fluid thermal physical uh, behavior of the water is roughly constant. Um, these issues of being able to have low flow rates, um, small spacings between fractures and large volume are what control the ability to be able to uh, develop the reservoir. So that we don't, where spacing is large, inject fluid which is cold and uh, recover fluid which is not much warmer, but we get this kind of full depletion of the heat from these closely spaced fractures close to the wellbore and a front that moves its way through the reservoir that has physically removed all the heat out of the reservoir. And so the breakthrough curves that we get are a steep decline, hopefully after a long period of time, after 30 years, rather than this long, slow decline at very low exit temperatures caused by a relatively uh, minor heat transfer area. If you look at the uh, sites that have been run uh, now ooh, um, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, for Rosemanos and Fenton Hill uh, in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, then the data for these in terms of this drawdown curve are actually quite steep. But these are quite steep and of course steep is ideal so long as this threshold time is late, uh, but it's only ideal so long as the actual time, not just the dimensionless time, is late in time, is close to this you know, 20 or 30 year design life from these, these systems. And so the, those are the, the key challenges in this. If you look at the spectrum of EGS through to sedimentary geothermal reservoirs and maybe hydrothermal reservoirs, then this expression actually gives you a pretty good feel for why the behavior of these different systems are, um, are different. The main parameter being fluid transmission, which is difficult. I'm looking for my, uh, oh yeah, there it is, my pointer. And that the permeabilities in hydrothermal reservoirs and also sedimentary geothermal reservoirs start quite high in the first place and you don't have to make them and are quite well distributed. And the heat transfer areas or the spacings between fractures or particles are often small in comparison to, uh, to basement reservoirs. So that kind of highlights the, the difference in those systems. It makes them much more thermally efficient in being able to uh, recover heat uh, and, and therefore much more uh, straightforward to develop. And also the other impacts of being able to retain seismicity relatively, at relatively low rates is also satisfied in these systems. And so the difficulty, challenge, and actually makes it a very nice scientific challenge, is in being able to uh, understand the response of these um, tightly interacting uh, fractured rocks with very strong feedbacks between the processes that occur within them. We know that in terms of injecting fluids into the, the subsurface and the heat output and the chemical changes, that we can expect that the order of evolution of those different effects is in the order of injection of fluids, which might reach a steady state in you know, days to weeks to months. Uh, recovery of heat shouldn't, if we're doing it right, because we want that to last for 30 years. And the kinetics of the reservoir in terms of chemical transformations is the, the finally a stage slower than that as well. And so all of these impacts have some effect on both the ability to be able to recover fluid from the reservoir through permeability, but also in the potential for induced seismicity, which has been a big issue for the past uh, EGS projects, Basel uh, onwards. Uh, most of the induced seismicity in the US has been related to the reinjection of fluids from hydrocarbon production. There has also been some that has occurred due to hydraulic fracturing, although much less and much more localized. Uh, 
such as in the, the western Western Alberta, Eastern Rockies uh, region of, of Canada. And all are driven by the issue of changing fluid thermal stresses within the, the system. And nowhere has this been more obvious than most recently for uh, the Pohang earthquake in South Korea. Uh, after stimulation of the reservoir, when this 5.5 magnitude event uh, occurred, which presumably is related to the, uh, the injection activities. And so looking at these behaviors, um, this very elegant uh, analysis by Magar from uh, 50 years ago now, in trying to balance the shear strain that's released from failure in the subsurface with changes in effective stresses that occur as a function of re-injecting fluids with some volume uh, is actually controlled by where you are on the stress earthquake recurrence uh, time scale. And so the time between individual events is here shown horizontally. The ramping up of stresses or reductions of strengths to get to peak strength and then to fail is shown by this cycle. And it matters whether you're inducing the earthquake by changing it from a quiescent state into charging the fault and then failing it, or whether the fault is 99% primed to fail, and as a result of that, uh, takes very little injection fluid to be able to fail. And so if you look at this plotting, this relationship, uh, which defines the, the strain energy released from the event as a function of the shear modulus rock and the volume injected, and this modifier based on where you are on the recurrence period, then you find that you end up with a series of curves. Uh, the usual one is if you're inducing an earthquake is that the, the magnitude of the moment is equal to the shear modulus times the injected volume, given that friction angle and uh, uh, reasonable values of Poisson ratio um, uh, drop out of the, the other variables. But the injection from Pohang was a relatively small volume and it gave a relatively large event, suggesting that the, the system was primed, ready to go, um, close to some critical point which was driven. And I didn't realize this until recently, uh, until reading, reading this paper, this paper by Hoffman in Geophysical Journal International, that the stimulation that had been done had been a so-called uh, soft stimulation, using cyclic uh, pulses, ramping up pulses uh, with a uh, traffic light system, had been largely successful. Uh, and certainly in terms of the events that occurred during the stimulation, they all existed down here, much below the event that ultimately um, caused the, the, uh, the shutdown of the project, which was uh, much later, much delayed from the stimulation that occurred. And so even, uh, unfortunately, maybe using quote-unquote soft stimulation methods, um, that's not enough if indeed the system is primed to fail, and of course you need to be able to work out what the, the indicators are that would define how close to failure you are. And so one way to, to maybe get around this um, is in looking at hydraulic fracturing as a stimulating method rather than um, uh, using hydro shearing. Uh, I could imagine that some advantage would be, at least if you drive a fracture, you drive it parallel and perpendicular to the principal stresses, and so if you are making native fractures uh, that are not natural, uh, but driving them yourself, then maybe there's a guard against uh, the impacts of induced seismicity. Um, the problem always has been for EGS is that these very efficient fractures that you develop for moving fluids aren't necessarily the ideal features that you'd have if you want to recover thermal energy from the system because they don't have large surface area uh, in their paths. And so you need to be able to design these in some smart way to be able to accommodate that. And so really to be able to realize the full potential, if you like, of the, the shale gas revolution, and then lots of people are, think, are thinking about this in terms of perhaps using hydraulic fracturing. You have to have smart wells that can turn on and turn off fractures. You have to have smart wells that can survive at very high temperatures. Maybe you have to have high temperature propants that are able to survive these kind of aggressive conditions. And you have to be able to control the whole system in a very um, uh, deliberate way, which I'm not sure that we know how to do yet. But maybe that is the, the future. It certainly would be nice if, uh, in terms of these engineered geothermal systems, 
that they could indeed be rather independent of the rocks that we induce them in. And you could just use a cookie cutter approach, provide some brute force approach that doesn't cause large amounts of seismicity, and then use that to be able to recover energy from the subsurface. Of course, even if you avoid developing um, seismicity from the initial stimulation phase, you're not necessarily clear because uh, the recovery of heat from the subsurface in this slower process will actually reduce effective stresses and uh, reduce strength as a result of this and perhaps result in seismicity. And so you can look at the recovery of energy uh, that would result from pumping um, at a given rate. And seismicity should not be a huge problem uh, in terms of the fluid pressures that it would have reached steady state by this time. But because you're injecting as much fluid as you're recovering, there's no net injection, but it is the flow rates into the system that would control the system. So the overall cumulative flow rate, including what you're taking out and the temperature that you're removing from the system, define the magnitude of the uh, energy release that can occur as a function of the long-term behavior for late time earthquakes. This post factor, if you use reasonable numbers like 10 to the minus five for the thermal expansion coefficient per degree Kelvin, 100 degrees centigrade, uh, turns out to be something like one over a thousand. And if you use that to look at the volumes that you can throughput through these before you generate such events, then you can change this to be able to look at the throughput from the system and the maximum magnitude events that you might get from it. Again, um, depending on where you exist, either inducing the earthquakes or triggering it where they're almost ready to, to, to result. So, so merely avoiding them at stimulation time is not necessarily a guarantee that you won't see them sometime later in the production phase. The fact that these events are large, 5.5 for Pohang, means that uh, they are probably not on small fractures, but on relatively large features, large faults. Faults that are maybe of the order of a kilometer or larger in single dimension. And so these also represent significant conduits that will be changed uh, in terms of their behavior uh, with relation to their permeability. Um, it's not been thought that drilling into faults is necessarily a good idea um, because of the connectedness of those features. But I see that the United Downs project in the southwest of England just now, which has completed drilling, is doing exactly that. So maybe that's one way to be able to, to also develop these uh, reservoirs. So if we look at um, permeability and how permeability evolves, clearly if you look in the natural world, um, slippage on faults is linked with changes in permeability. Uh, it's apparent at field scale for things like the San Andreas faults, where far field earthquakes have given uh, observed changes in permeability in material close to monitoring points distant from faults, and that these changes in permeability have been heralded by observed changes in velocity, um, slowing of seismic velocities as, it, as the material dilates as the faulting occurs, and then increases in velocity the occurring, delay times occurring as they recompact. You see it in the field, you see it in terms of uh, prompted increases in permeability in the lab by similar events, and the same softening and then stiffening of fractures observed through um, uh, acoustic measurements. And so those certainly act as a way to be able to prospect for changes in permeability in the, in the subsurface. But failure on faults and earthquakes that result is clearly a dynamic process. Um, earthquakes occur in two flavors. Regular earthquakes, uh, like Tohoku earthquake and the, the Boxing Day earthquake, are fast earthquakes or regular earthquakes that release their energy uh, in something of the order of 90 seconds or so. Uh, a single magnitude 8 earthquake is roughly the same uh, energy as the power integrated over a year for the uh, world's um, five, 15 terawatt capacity. Uh, but slow earthquakes, which occur over months to years, release the same amount of energy, but over a much extended time period. So understanding the difference between these uh, methods of uh, generating deformation seismic versus aseismic, 
is presumably a key also to understanding the changes in permeability that might result in these systems as a result of uh, fault reactivation. And one way to be able to view these is in terms of these kind of block slider models with a fault that's pulled by a load point that moves at constant velocity and transmits force to the fault which grows as a string is uh, stretched by the lengthening uh, displacement. And the requirements for instability are that one, you have to um, fail the rock. Two, when it fails, it has to be velocity weakening as it fails. And three, in addition to that, the third uh, necessary requirement is that as you fail, the stiffness of the material around the fault, as a result, if you like, of the geometry of the fault, has to be softer than the fault itself so that it can eject the energy of the surrounding material through the fault. So, for instance, as a fault lengthens, it becomes softer, and as, as um, for instance, a pressure pulse expands outwards, you expect that the area that it affects will, will grow. That affected area will represent a longer fault, and therefore the stiffness of that fault will potentially grow as a function of time. And so if we can relate this seismic behavior of the fault to either the length of the fault, the longer faults are more likely to be seismic, larger values of this stra peak stress to uh, peak strength to residual strength weakening parameter uh, and larger values of effective stresses all drive the propensity to generate dynamic behavior. And so the idea here is that if you can define the behavior of the system in terms of this um, brittleness parameter, ductile when this is uh, either zero or positive, and uh, brittle when this is negative, then you can use that to define the potential for seismicity and use that as an index to be able to say something about the evolution of permeability and how that might be affected by uh, the form of deformation that you have, seismic versus aseismic. So faults are complex structures with a core and with a damage region outside, so they clearly have a scale effect. And evaluating their behavior at that native scale is probably useful. Um, some interesting experiments have been done using uh, this uh, tool that's been used at uh, Colab, the, the SIMFIP, the former HPP, Hydraulic Pulse Protocol to be able to pack off a zone and to measure deformations, and then to inflate it to be able to reactivate faults and look at the behavior. And so this gives you the, the option to be able to inject fluids, to elevate pressures within the zone, and to develop uh, reactivation of faults both elastically, that might cause aseismically, and then ultimately develops to be seismic as the patch zone grows and potentially becomes larger, and then implicates the fact that you can develop a, a large-scale failure, which, because of the softness of that fault, has the potential to be seismic. And so if we can define the attributes of deformation with these in systems through rate-state behavior, and if we can link permeability evolution to, for instance, uh, dilation that results from uh, deformation of the fault, which is in turn related to rate-state behavior, then we have the potential to be able to link observations of changes in permeability that result also to the changes in dilation that occur, which are similarly conditioned to the rate state response. And so the kind of dilation that you might get within a system, this is gouge rather than a, a fault, but will occur uh, as a function of reaching a peak strength and then a residual strength. Uh, we can, if we can link this dilation to a volume change and link this to a permeability somehow, then we have a way of being able to link seismicity, if you like, to the permeability that might result from it. Um, we can use rate state behavior to try and do that. Um, and so if we give uh, velocity stepping experiments with up steps in velocity that give changes in friction, in this case, this is velocity weakening behavior, uh, predictions of porosity that change, uh, result from that, we can also determine how permeability might change. And we can go into the laboratory, not use these field experiments, but in the laboratory do experiments on sheared fractures that might represent portions of the uh, flanking fault damage zone and see how permeability changes as a function of the strength along this feature 
as you evolve deformation. So you can measure changes in friction that occur as a function of a stepwise uh, change in displacement. You can measure permeability that occurs as a function of that. And you can try and link both observations uh, as these noisy data with a theory that you might think for a step change in velocity that gives you a dilation that partly fits the, the noisy data that are in place. With the idea that if you can link the frictional characteristics in terms of behavior which is either stable with a positive a minus b coefficient rate state parameter or unstable with a negative value then you might be able to codify the changes in permeability that result from these two different styles of deformation as one particular goal and so if you do this for different mineralogies we know for instance that different mineralogies give both say uh, limestones and clays typically give velocity strengthening behavior and quartz typically velocity weakening behavior uh, and so if you look at the behaviors as you get as you shear materials with different mineralogical contents clays carbonates and quartz then typically with clays as you increase the magnitude of the clay content they become progressively more velocity strengthening also for carbonates and the changes in permeability uh, tend to become uh, are reduced as a function of shearing. The converse is true for the velocity weakening materials which become more velocity weakening as quartz content increases for instance on the right and the propensity of permeability in these cases to go in the opposite direction. So these are important observations that def define response. And so understanding this linkage between deformation behavior, brittle and ductile, uh, and trying to link it to permeabilities has some ability to be able to make uh, sense of what might be going on uh, within reservoirs. We said that there are three requirements that suggest that whether behavior will be seismic or aseismic. You have to fail the fracture, it has to be weaker once it fails than before it fails, and that the surrounding material has to be softer than the fault itself for it to uh, eject its energy through the system. But there's a fourth requirement which we didn't mention, and that is that you have to have healing. If you don't have healing, you have one event, and then it's a residual friction, and it doesn't fail again, it just dis displaces. And so if you want to have multiple events, then you have to allow healing to occur. And so healing can be shown by these uh, slide-hold-slide tests. You fail the material, you hold it for 3,000 seconds, then you attempt to reactivate it again, and you measure the change in strength gain that has resulted from this. But you can also measure the change in permeability that happens as a result of this repose period which has allowed healing to occur and sealing and then reactivation which allows the generation of permeability to occur. If you do that you see this characteristic behavior in all cases. You see um, a reactivation phase where permeability increases. You see a repose phase where healing occurs um, that occurs over time just like observations that are seen in uh, the field in, in nature. These are far field observations for distant earthquakes, an uptick in permeability when the uh, event hits, and over many months to a year, a reduction back to background levels in terms of permeability, again another far field earthquake, and then healing again, that mimics these laboratory results that have this same um, rate dependent decline, this power law decline that occurs. And if you look at this behavior for a variety of different materials, both in this case shales and um, Green, River, Green River shale and also Wesley granite, you get this uh, actually quite similar behavior in terms of the uh, temporal exponent in these parallel relationships. It turns out also that the amount of hold time that you apply uh, before you re reactivate the fracture has an effect as well. If the hold time is very small, when you reactivate it, it compacts. If the hold time is much longer, then it, the reactivation is dilationary and results in an increase in permeability that then uh, returns to background levels over extended periods of time. So you can certainly plot hold duration as a function of the magnitude of permeability increase and you see some trend in behavior that results in these. And so what we've attempted to do is at least try and link the magnitudes of deformations through a logical way, which is rate state behavior, to use that to evaluate permeabilities and then to look at styles of permeability change that evolve as a function of those different styles of deformation 
quiet uh, deformation, aseismic deformation versus seismic deformation, really being the uh, boundary between uh, ductile response and brittle response. So in the same way of linking deformation behavior to changes in permeability, um, we can also attempt to use these same characteristics to understand um, behaviors in the subsurface at um, reservoir scale and at project scale. Um, the first of these two examples is looking at the behavior uh, in the Newbury project uh, with this missing zone of, of seismicity between the, uh, the toe of the well, cased well, and the base of the well. Initial stimulation gave micro-seismicity and MEQs at the base. Uh, if you fail at the base and the well pressures are um, hydrostatic up through the system, then you should also, for a normal stress regime, fail it up through the column as well. Uh, certainly that happened in the zone of the casing, maybe due to the broken casing here particularly, but there was this zone of missing uh, seismicity that occurred in this area here. So the question is, what is the reason for that? One way to approach that is to look at um, the behavior, ductile versus brittle behavior of the subsurface in terms of the reservoir rocks, uh, in this case recovered through drill cuttings, and then tested through velocity stepping experiments to look at the magnitudes of their brittle versus ductile coefficients, this so-called A minus B coefficients. And if you do that, you find that at the very deepest depths of the, the wellbore, at 3,000 meters, the cuttings give you um, A minus B values which are barely positive and tending towards negative, suggesting velocity weakening behavior, hence potentially seismic, so long as the fractures are large enough. Higher up in the stratum, the magnitudes are velocity uh, strengthening, and therefore you can make the case that that is the reason that you don't see seismicity here, or maybe that the fractures were too small to be able to support it. And at the much higher regions where there was also seismicity due to the leaking uh, casing, um, their velocity um, strengthening but if you wash out the calcite that's present within the system to simulate the fact that waters might remove calcite from material, calcite being a, a ductile mineral, then you start bringing these again towards being um, uh, brittle and therefore the propensity to uh, induce observable seismicity then occurs. The other opportunity to, uh, for using seismicity, of course, is to use it as an indicator of the health of your reservoir and as a monitor on the evolution of permeability that uh, evolves in your reservoir. And so this is a suggestion that maybe you can use the microearthquakes for which you have uh, moment tensor solutions, for which you have fault plane solutions, to be able to go through a workflow that allows you to take, for instance, the uh, focal solutions to be able to define the orientations of the fractures that are failing. Uh, from that orientation, be able to define the mode of displacement uh, that occurs. Um, from knowledge of a standard stress drop, somewhere between 0.1 of a megapascal to 10 megapascal, or typical magnitudes, to be able to use the magnitude to be able to define the fracture size. To link fracture size through these uh, kind of fractal scaling relationships to define roughness of the fracture. If stress drop and fracture size gives, gives you an offset of the fault, then you can use that to get dilation. And if you know dilation, you can use that to get permeability. And so potentially you can use the magnitudes of the events that you get to be able to evaluate the changes in permeability that you might expect to get on fractures. Uh, but of course, as we all know, these systems aren't really very well constrained. Collab is, uh, but Newbury isn't when you're uh, 3,000 meters away from the closest uh, uh, seismometers to be able to look at seismicity. And so, uh, although you can constrain the magnitudes of the changes in permeability that you get as a result of individual events, the only chance you have to constrain it is by bulk uh, flow magnitudes that occur in the subsurface. And the only way that you have to be able to constrain these is to be able to use this radius versus time plot, a Serge Shapiro plot, I always call it, uh, that define as a function of this diffusing front, as diffusing as a function of time, representing in some way the hydraulic diffusivity of the system, which you can then convert into 
an equivalent permeability that describes the, the behavior of the system. And so that's uh, our, my attempt at least to be able to talk about some of the key issues and maybe some of the key things that can be done uh, within these systems to be able to understand what's going on. We've made the case um, that these EGS systems are particularly different, difficult to, to uh, stimulate. Uh, the key is really in being able to get heat out of the system, meaning that we want to get large magnitude flow rates, which means um, milli Darcy permeability, but also with enough heat transfer area to be able to make sure that happens. And it's much more difficult to do that in EGS basement systems, the very systems which are implicated for large seismic events in fluid reinjection uh, systems, such as in Oklahoma, um, which make them difficult to be able to um, stimulate in the first place and difficult to be able to stimulate uh, quiescently uh, in the second place. Much more difficult than reservoirs which have native permeability in the first place and where that permeability perhaps has relatively short uh, distances between individual fractures and of course completely different from hydrothermal systems which are typically in pull-apart regions where extensional strains are complete, um, continuously renewing the permeability uh, to keep it at relatively high levels. The key challenges are making permeability in an environmentally benign way in these fractured very effective stress sensitive uh, materials which are sensitive to effective stresses resulting from hydraulic stimulation, thermal stimulation, and chemical stimulation, which is uh, the problem uh, at the root of induced or triggered seismicity. And so certainly understanding this difference between induced versus triggered seismicity in terms of where you are in terms of the priming of the fractures for failure is a key issue, I think, in understanding the magnitudes of the events that you might get out of it. And also understanding this linkage between how permeability relates to the styles of deformation and uh, that occur either seismically or aseismically is important, and linking this also to heat transfer area. So in terms of seismicity, where the events we know that can be large, then this means that the faults are relatively large. Uh, we know these events can be driven both by uh, stimulation, fluid pressures, and also by production, and presumably even in the longer term by changes in strength due to uh, chemical changes in the system. And importantly, uh, triggered events and induced events, understanding where we are on the earthquake recurrence cycle is an important feature uh, to allow us to be able to predict exactly what's going to happen. If we accept the fact that in these pressure-sensitive fractured rocks, um, permeability is strongly linked to deformation, uh, and that deformation and the styles of deformation are strongly linked to either seismic response or aseismic deformation, and that these behaviors are explained relatively completely in terms of rate state behavior, then we can use the concept of rate state behavior, uh, seismic and aseismic deformation, to be able to understand the major controls on permeability. And if we know that the controls on rate state response are mineralogy, uh, modes of dynamic stressing, and healing and sealing, then it's not a great surprise that those controls on deformation also have impacts on the evolution of permeability that occurs in the system. All is not completely lost, of course. Uh, we can use that understanding, at least of the deformation response, to be able to decipher anomalous responses, such as Newbury, where we have this missing zone of seismicity at intermediate depths. And of course, uh, if we have enough understanding of the linkage between seismicity and permeability, then we can use it as a reservoir management tool to be able to understand evolution of uh, permeability in a dynamic sense and also in a spatial sense within reservoirs to be able to understand what's going on and maybe to be able to uh, control and manage reservoirs to get the most out of them. Uh, to be able to make, as we'd all like, EGS to be a viable method of massive thermal recovery on the, on the planet. Okay, I probably talked too quickly and for too long, but I thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions if there's time for that. Thanks very much.